thank you for joining us today. So this uh, is another live Twitter space panel brought to you by uh, the Oxus Society. And uh, Bruce has just jumped in. I'll just quickly send him the speaker invite again, invite to speak. Um, now we're focusing on the protests uh, in the Palmiers, Palmiers of the region uh, at the moment, as there's been protests throughout that region uh, for the last couple of days. And this has been an escalating problem for uh, Tajikistan for an, a number of months now. So joining us this week is Bruce Panier, who is a absolute uh, you know, monolith when it comes to Central Asia expertise. Uh, and I think everyone here probably knows who Bruce is quite well. Sinyat uh, Sultanaeva, who is a Central Asia analyst down at Human Rights Watch. And uh, uh, we're also having uh, Bak Sakharov, uh, who is a, uh, the director of Central Asian Consulting. And I'm uh, going to start with Sinyat. Uh, you know, for people who maybe don't understand too much about the difference between uh, the Kota Barakshan and the rest of uh, Tajikistan, can you give us a bit of a rundown on how different the sort of west of the country is from people living in the capital? Um, I, I would invite uh, Buck to um, add here as well and, and Bruce as well. Um, I'm, I, I do believe that they might know better uh, than me, but um, I'll be the sort of like the, uh, the person, uh, I'm going to be the person who might... Uh, who the, the rest of the listeners might um, associate themselves with uh, uh, more, uh, considering that I'm only sort of starting with my work in Tajikistan. So this is so far what I understand uh, the differences are, is that um, the Gordon Badashan Autonomous Region, it, it is an um, autonomous region. It has a fair amount of autonomy, um, at least on the paper. Uh, in reality, economy-wise and politically, militarily, it's still uh, quite um, sort of subordinate to uh, central Tajikistan. Um, the, there is um, an ethnically and culturally, from what I understand, also the people in uh, Gabao or Panir, um, uh, they uh, do share quite a lot in common with uh, central Tajikistan, rest of Tajikistan, but at the same time, there's a... Um, difference uh, in terms of religion that's practiced in uh, Gabal, uh, Ismaili, um, uh, Ismaili Islam, which is um, uh, sort of like a subsection of the Shia uh, Islam. Um, and uh, there has been, um, uh, again, from what I'm understanding, there has been um, a long-standing um, tension between uh, Pamir or Gabao and the rest of Tajikistan, um, escalating uh, since about 2012. Uh, but even before that, um, and, you know, we would have to really dive into the history of Tajikistan, um, especially post-Soviet Tajikistan, because, um, um, again, uh, the uh, region uh, became or, like, uh, I guess, sort of started, um, was positioned in opposition to Rahman's regime um, during the uh, civil war and then um, and for immediately after it, afterwards. Um Bach, would you like to add maybe um, a little bit more? Sure, thank you. Oh, no, you pretty much covered. Thank you, everyone, for for invitation and for thank you very much for the uh, for, for the you know for the Ox Society for inviting and caring about the Gorno Badashan. Uh, like I said, my name is Bakhtiur Safarov, and I am a director of Central Asia Consulting uh, Group uh, that is based here in Washington D.C. We predominantly work in uh, real estate development, and we also do some strategic consulting as well. So in addition to what Sanat said, so the Gorno Badakhshan Autonomous Oblast is, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's the, in, if you talk about the, in terms of population, it's around 250,000, 260 who people live there, but people, but the number is, uh, you know, only 3% of the total population. So there is, the population is, uh, hasn't been growing since the collapse of the Soviet Union. The number, the one thing that I also would add that what is, distinguishes Gordon Badakhshan autonom Autonomous Region from the rest of the country is, uh, is their political views. So during the 1992, the independence, the Gordon Badakhshan Autonomous Oblast, majority of people, were the pro uh, independent uh, movement, so they 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 were coming, starting the protest, and uh, that's why they kind of uh, uh, were people people try consider them in the government, uh, consider them as an opposition since then, and the government uh, started the operation in 1993 to go through Pamirs but it was stopped several times. So the operation is not new. We've, when we lived there, 
uh, we always were expecting them to come. So I would say the operation started not in now, not 2012, but it started in 1993. So it's been going on for, for 30 years now. So, yeah, so the operation started 30 years ago and, uh, you know, it's been going on since then. So many uh, of the operation were different. Some of them are smaller scale, some of them are bigger scale, but it's been ongoing for 30 years. So, and uh, with, 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 with this particular situation, uh, this all happened on May 14th. Uh, I was like, when I was at, at my desk and, and, uh, and I pulled out the, the, my, my Twitter and my Facebook and my social media, I saw that the people of Barhoro wanted to gather. And uh, like for everyone else, I thought, oh, that's good to gather. Then I remember that that's in Tajikistan. So it's going to be difficult. So I immediately felt that it's not going to be, it's not going to end up well because it's Tajikistan. You can't gather. And I immediately, you know, posted, you know, with social media. And I thought that other people were also concerned. And then we start following it. And uh, the next day, the May 16, when people wanted to go, you know, they stopped them and uh, they start shooting. The guy, Zamir Nazarshoev, 29 years old uh, man, was killed by sniper rifle. And uh, there are some other injuries. And uh, the government, instead of... Uh, you know, reacting to it, investigating it, they, they didn't they didn't stop. Now they, they send additional troops for this unarmed people. And it, it sparks more protests in Rusham because the Rusham people didn't want this military convoy going to Horo. And uh, this is basically what happened is on May 18th, the, the government started deliberately shooting people. So now we have 17 people confirmed uh, I mean, I confirm. I just pulled up, you know, from open source, and I see that 17 people were killed only yesterday on May 18th. And they used helicopters. They, they took very heavy military against those civilians. So, and then we we just following up. Now, yesterday they said they they're gonna start another operation in Horo. They 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 gave an ultimatum to hand over Mamad Bokhir, Mamad Bokhirov. So at this point, we just stay, stay tuned and then and, and listening what's observing. So what's what's going to happen next? So my deepest apologies for that one. My uh, Twitter space app was a bit, a bit funny there. But Bruce, I'm going to throw this question to you. Obviously, there have been protests in Gordo Badakhshan before. Uh, how do these ones compare to, let's say, uh, the protests in November last year or even the protests in 1992 that were prelude to effectively the Tajik civil war? Hello, can hey, you Bruce. hear me? Hello? Yes, I can, hear you. I can hear you, Bruce. You're far away. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, well, obviously, you know, the, the fact that um, that the violence sparked so quickly and so intensely, I suppose, is, is a little bit of a surprise, but not that much. You know, you got to remember in November, it was there was a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, people were protesting, but it certainly wasn't a sh an open shooting affair like we've seen right now. Um, although, you know, the, the events in November, of course, have been started the tensions that have built up to this as our guests have already gone over. I mean, this is, this is a tense region anyway. And after the killing of this young man uh, last November and, and what seemed like is, you know, zero um, legitimate attempt to try to uncover the facts behind his killing or something that, you know, people have been uh, getting uneasy about the situation there for a while. The, do we know that the government has been trying to get some people to go on TV and, and basically denounce other, other uh, leaders of the region and stuff. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a little bit different. In, in 1992, of course, everything everything was new and it was independence. And, and uh, Tajikistan went through this intense period where there were protests up there, too. And, and as Bach said, um, it's, it's difficult to get up there. So they couldn't do much about it. Um, I would compare this current one a lot more to what happened in 2012. It's kind of similar um to what was going on back then where the tension was building for a while and then it finally snapped and we got this but still i'm, I'm really surprised that the, this seems to be a uh, really harsh crackdown on the part of the government the other conflicts as i remember kind of were more they developed gradually 
in places. I mean, it got it got a little violent, and then it got more violent, it got real violent. Whereas this one just exploded, you know, and, and it was real violent right from the start, which shows the government really wanted to send some kind of message about, um, you know, trying to trying to get control of the region. And I, I really st- I can't stress that enough: control of the region, because this is one of the most bizarre uh, policies that the government in Dushan Bay has: is they neglect this area consistently. It, it doesn't see very much money coming from the government. You know, it has a high unemployment rate. Um, you know, goods come from China and go to Dushan Bay and come back from Dushan Bay and go to China. And, and it leaves out Badakhshan because the Rahman family has all these deals with these companies shipping stuff. So, they, you know, the people in Badakhshan don't get any taxes or anything like, you know, any duties. Uh, they, they're no, not much development coming from this. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, the government regularly accuses um local bandits you know informal leaders if you will but bandits is is like obstructing uh the situation causing problems in the region so uh it's it's kind of a strange claim coming from people in the tajik government to say that there's criminals operating up in the east since so many criminals are really in the government and certainly members of the rahman family um but you know, so so like I said, they want them to be to be obedient to Dushan Bay in Gornabakshan. They want them to be obedient to Dushan Bay, but they do nothing for them. And they complain that there's crime up there in Gornabakshan, but the government doesn't do anything to stimulate the economy so that you can get legitimate work. Um, you know, local leaders. It's it, some people have even said, you know, these were warlords during this during the Civil War days. Maybe they were. Um, you know, I suppose you could characterize them as that. But the fact is that at least they, they provide some source of income to the region. It, unfortunately, illegal means, but you can get a job and make a living, uh, you know, and, and in the absence of anything coming from the center, uh, what, you know, what do they expect? So, like I said, it's, it's a strange relationship to watch because the Tajik government seems to want them to be, uh, you know, totally under the control of Dushan Bay, even though Dushan Bay really doesn't do anything. For the region at all. If it wasn't for the Aga Han, there'd be hardly anything developed up there in the since independence. See now, now obviously this has been uh, a, a difficult time for Tajikistan with lots and lots of uh, Tajik ethnic workers coming back from Russia into Tajikistan in the recent inflow. Do you, why would Rahman choose now to crack down so harshly? Do you think there was there's something behind that decision? Uh, well, you know, okay, I had to, real quickly, obviously this is part of a campaign. Remember, they've arrested a couple of people uh, who were in Russia, actually, but they were from Gorno Badakhshan, right? And they, they spoke out online. I mean, one of them was a mixed mixed martial arts fighter, uh, you know, and, and they the Russians detained them and sent them back to Tajikistan just in the last couple of weeks, you know, last few weeks. Uh, this has happened and they were tried, and, you know, and convicted right away. So, I mean, th- this just adds fuel to the fire, but it also shows that this is part of a campaign that the government's uh, running. They, they've done this before to try to try to exert their control over the region. That's what, like we just heard, all these, all these previous conflicts started with the government deciding to move more security forces or troops up into that area. And that, that sparked it every single time. And so this is the latest of those attempts, although it's one of the harshest of those attempts. Sinat, why do you think Rockmont has chosen this this very harsh method for uh, uh, controlling the protests here? Um, I guess on, on my part, on my part, that would be more of a, um, again just um, thoughts on why this might be happening. Um, I would say that um, again, and and I've. I've I think I think you're having a bit of technical difficulties there. So I'm going to throw this question to Bach. You know, why do you think this uh, this particular protest has got such a, a, a heavy response from Rahman? Uh I think the main thing is behind this is economical reasons because uh, the due to the economy and uh, what's uh, what's expecting to face Tajikistan. I think uh, Rahman wants to reduce those threats to minimum. And that's why they want to make sure there won't be any protest or any discontent from anywhere when they start you know, expecting those uh, consequences. As you know, the, the large portion of GDP for Tajikistan is coming from remittances from Russia. And uh, 
they probably expecting those uh, migrants to come back or uh, they won't be able to send money and that's going to be a lot of discontent. So they want to make sure there won't be any sources of, uh, uh, you know, protests in the country. So that's why I think this time it was harsher than, than, uh, than previous ones. So, Bruce, there's been a lot of speculation by some analysts that this may be a similar situation to uh, the protests we saw in Kazakhstan in January, that we may see either Russian intervention or outside intervention. You know, obviously, there are already Chinese, uh, Indian and Russian bases sitting in Tajikistan. Do you think those countries are likely to get involved in this particular domestic dispute? No, I mean, generally in Central Asia, people try to, uh, especially that far south in Central Asia, most of the big countries that have an interest or influence out there to perhaps stay out of it. It really is a domestic dispute, and I don't think it compares very much to Kazakhstan. I mean, this concerns one region and a set of specific grievances, legitimate grievances that the people have up there, but it doesn't affect, you know, again, we've heard the ethnically these people are, are different than than the Tajiks. Um, so their their message will resonate a little bit throughout the country, but but it won't, you know, in northern Tajikistan or something. You're not going to get people to protest because of the situation in Gornobadakshan. Um, you know that that won't happen. Uh, so I, you know, it's different. It's different in that way that um, uh, it would. I can't imagine see this sparking like a widespread protest like we saw in Kazakhstan. You know, and again, I don't. It, you know, all these countries are reluctant to interfere. Russia would be the only one possibly that would do it because it, you know it does have the big military base there. Uh, but even then, I think, especially given that Russia is occupied with other matters at the moment. Um, that they probably wouldn't want to, to have to interfere in this. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine this would get out of control of the Tajik government, even if they lost the territory uh, temporarily. Um, they, it wouldn't threaten the sovereignty of, of the rest of Tajikistan or anything. Um, you know, and, and I, I should have asked when the, your previous question, just to also mention why, why, why now? Um, you know, again, I, I had kind of given the longer view that tensions have been growing, but uh, you know, T Tajikistan straight, has a lot of security problems at the moment, uh, which I was amazed they launched this. But they, they got problems with the Afghan border and the people that are on the other side. And we saw that the Islamic State of Khorasan actually launched some rockets into Tajikistan just, just a few days back. Um, you know, and we know that Jamayat Ansarullo, which is a domestic Tajik terrorist group, uh, is also just over the border in Afghanistan. And they got problems along the Kyrgyz border, too. Um, whether Rahman decided that he couldn't afford to have tensions in Gorno Badakhshan and these other two problems going on at the same time and tried to tried to get rid of at least one of the problems that was really under his control, more or less, um, that, that he was going to go for it, you know, figuring that summer would only get worse along the northern and southern borders. So if you just join us, this is a uh, Oxa Society Twitter space on the protests in the Pamirs, uh, focusing on the recent tensions in Gordo Badakhshan. And joining us today is Bruce Panier, a uh, very renowned journalist on Central Asian Affairs. Uh, we've also got uh, we've also got Buck, uh, who's joined us, who is a, a director of uh, Central Asian uh, Central Asia Consulting. Uh, and we've also got uh, Sinyat Sotombaeva, who is a researcher for Human Rights Watch, focusing on Central Asia. And if you have any questions you want to put through to our panel, I have got our Twitter DMs open at the moment. So feel free to send the questions through here and I'll be able to pitch them to our uh, fantastic experts. But Buck, I'm going to ask you this next one. What would it take to actually de-escalate this? I know that Tajikistan has been talking to the United States, hoping for some extra funding uh, and talking to other partners, hoping to get some more funding. You know, is there anything that Rahman could do apart from these very, very heavy tactics to try and uh, quell the situation? No, Rahman will not do anything. So the only way to de-escalate is to empower the, the people of Badakhshan. Uh, there is nothing, that the, the response is going to be even harsher. And as you know now, in, uh, in what they, they actually have done in Rushon, it's a very similar, we call it the Bucha, the Bucha of Tajikistan right now. So basically they, they killed everyone. They didn't let the people go and pick up the, the, the dead bodies because they were hit by snipers and they were bleeding on the roads and they didn't allow them to go and pick them up. And now they gave them these 17 bodies and they go door to door. They capture people. They're almost more than 200 detainees right now. And uh, they go to houses. They, they steal the people. People go back and they see they don't have the money, they don't have the, the, 
the jewelries and uh, some other valuable items. So this is, I don't think that Rahman is going to back down. The only reason is like in everybody with every other bullies and dictators, you, you have to empower the people. That's the only, that's the only thing I see in the escalation here. That's the only solution. So Bruce, obviously you've been, you're a veteran reporter in this area of the world, you know, with the internet being cut to the region and communications also being severed, how is information getting to the press uh, and how difficult will it be to actually get accurate reporting on what's going on on the ground over there at the moment? Well, I think it would be impossible to get accurate reporting on, on what's happening there, the, the way they've shut down communications with that area. I mean, I heard, you know, even phones are having a hard time. I suppose some people have some system of phone or uh uh, something that can get them through and, and then it's kind of a chain from there if they can get a call through to Dushan Bay then maybe they call, get calls through to other places I know our, the Tajik service at Radio Liberty was um, saying that they were having all kinds of problems keeping in touch with people at the moment too which is of course precisely what the government w wants in this case but that's that raises a lot of concerns about what's really going on out there um, you know because it is so difficult to get information and, and um, you know, I mean, even yesterday they had the report that a helicopter got shot down, but it, it didn't get shot down from Tajikistan. It got shot down from Afghanistan, which seemed kind of crazy, but in that part of the world, not impossible, I suppose. Um, but that ended up not being true, apparently. Uh, at least there's no evidence that's come, that's come forth um, since then to indicate that. So that's, that's the problem we've got, you know, is it, it's hard to say. We know that it's a, it, it's a really hard response. Um, you know, but the, but the Tajik government's controlling the narrative. And of course, they put up that they were uh, that grew, armed groups had blocked the highway, you know, from Dushan Bay to, to Harog and three different places and attacked government soldiers. And, and it's, as, it's a real doubtful story. And I also, also mentioned at this point that the Tajik government's credibility, the, his history historically has not been good. Uh, usually when there's a crisis in the country, whatever they say, is is wrong you know like 80 90 percent wrong um and that's been consistent for years and years now the story that they tell at first is not even close to what's going on so uh it's tough to know what's happening out there seeing that you know i uh, if you can hear me uh you know do you think people in dushanbe and i'm going to ask buck this question as well are aware of what's going on in uh, in god or frankly the censorship is effect is preventing people in dushanbe knowing what's going on in the, in the region of the moment um, can you hear me? I hope this is their technical. Yep, you're coming, you're coming, okay, through, much you're coming through much better now. Great, thanks. Um, so um, I do believe from um, at, at least talking to my contacts in Dushanbe, uh, it, it does seem like they do have um, an awareness of what's happening in uh, in Horok, in, in Kabao. Um, and, um, but possibly they're also getting the information the same way I am getting, for example, and many others who are on the panel, for example, or like just generally listening in right now. And that's uh, through the Telegram channels. Um, there are several Telegram channels that are covering this um, sort of like kind of live coverage of uh, events as they're unfolding. Um, apart from that, there's um, Ozodi, as Bruce already mentioned, but uh, they also, um, you can't really rely on Ozodi right now to get very up-to-date information as they also have to verify their sources. So this is quite difficult uh, in that sense. But I, I do believe that they are aware of what's happening in, in Panir. So, Bark, what is the narrative being put forward by Dushanbe around this issue? Is it uh, are they reporting anywhere near the truth, or is it just a small protest in their account? What are how are they reporting on this? Uh, so, so far, we just get reports from uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs. I believe there are only two or three statements on this. While uh, when they started the first day, second first day when they shot the. Zamir uh, Nazar, Nazar Shoev, and the second one, I believe it was uh, yesterday, and maybe another one. So very limited information coming from the government. And uh, in terms of uh, the population, I mean, the, how population can get any information. There is, there, every time there is anything, situ any situation come in, the internet gets cut off. And uh, from November until late uh, March, there was no internet. They, they gave internet back on March 21st. So it was already, we already didn't know what was going on since literally since November. 
and now they came back a little bit. The speed was low. Now there is nothing again. So we can say that the the communication was cut off from November 2021 un until now. So the information is completely limited. So we don't know. We don't really know what's going on. It's 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 very very dangerous and it's very uh, you know unpredictable what can happen over there. If I may add, there's also um, it's very clear that the government is also painting this as um, uh, again uh, this might this might have been mentioned that it's 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 a it's an anti-terrorist uh, operation, right? So um, all of the protesters are painted as extremists and terrorists, um, and there is you know the government is kind of is is going is really going the 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 lengths to lengths uh, to um, describe them as such and to build the links with say, Afghanistan, for example, as opposed to just really recognizing that they have grievances and this is, this is a protest and this is, a, um, this is people exercising their freedom of um, assembly. So we've got lots of questions coming in from our, from our DMs at the moment. I'm going to throw this one at Bruce. You know, a lot of people are speculating that this is, A, a bit of a uh, you know, flow-on effect from the war in Ukraine. And I guess the other, you know, if we're talking about Russia, I know that you know tomorrow Rachman was supposed to fly into Russia to be attend the uh, the Russia Islamic World Kazan summit. Uh, do you think that he will actually appear at that summit now that these protests are intensifying? Uh, and is this, you know, is this attributable to uh, Ukraine making this conflict worse? Uh, well, the first one, you know, did he do it after in consultation with Russia? I, I find that one hard to believe a little bit because, like I said, Russia's got. Um, you know, Russia's occupied in Ukraine. I can't believe that, you know, Putin would say, uh, well, we can't really help. We're not in a position where we can help you if this goes wrong. But, well, you know, go ahead. Um, you know, this is a bad time. If, if Rachman's depending on Russia to give him the green light and, and without any pledge or any credible pledge of support for this operation, then uh, I don't know, like I said, I, I don't see that that would be um, where that would work. Um, as far as him going to see Putin, absolutely. He's going to want any guarantees and or assurances he can get, uh, you know, and, and they do have obviously some other things to talk about. But um, but he'll go there just because if nothing else, I'm sure Putin will tell him you're doing exactly the right thing. Um, you know, so he, he won't miss he won't want to miss a meeting like that. He might need Putin's help in the future with something that has nothing to do with Nagorno-Karabakh. He's got a lot of problems. Tajikistan has a lot of problems. So, uh, yeah, he'll go. Do you think Russia will openly put uh, support behind Rachman for this for this crackdown? I'm going to throw this one to Buck. Uh, I I certainly believe they would uh, because we just we got a real novelty. as you know the Kremlin control media they already uh, labeled the protester as an organized criminal group. So and then you can see that they I mean, at least they didn't call them terrorists, but it's still uh, they're calling the uh, peaceful protester as a as an organized uh, crime uh, group. So I think that's kind of a hand uh, from from Russia. And uh, also uh, in terms of geopolitics, as you know, at least two uh, Chinese bases, uh, one one big and one uh, one like joint military already operating in uh, in um, in Gorno Badakhshan and a lot, a lot of speculation says that that uh, this uh, was uh, kind of coordinated during the Beijing Olympics when uh, when Rahmon and Putin and uh, President Xi or any other Chinese official that's probably should have been done at the same time because we have uh, reports from coming from, from, from soldiers who are residents of Gabao who are serving in Tajik military. They were not allowed to go back now for three months after the services expired. So it's just, it's just very, very you know, interesting why they didn't let people, why they didn't let the you know, soldiers to finish the, 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 the service and go back. So that's, that's kind of, you know... Uh, uh, things to to watch too. 
So uh, Sinat has just uh, dropped out for a second. She's been coming back. So I'm going to uh, throw this one to Bruce again. Do you think that Rockman might take the uh, opportunity to sort of flex his muscles and show the Taliban that he can control his own borders and that he has, uh, you know, full rule over his own domain? Uh, and this is a good, a good way to demonstrate to the Taliban that Dushanbe is in full control of the country. Uh, that's a gamble if he's going to do that. Um, it's a, you know, I, I suppose it would, again, he's got a lot of reasons why he probably wants to get that under his control. If not for nothing else, then, um, you know, it's eluded him for so long. Uh, I suppose he could claim something like that. I'm not sure uh, how much, I suppose it would send a message to the Taliban a little bit, but I don't think it, it would terrify them uh, at all, you know, that, that they were able to get a tighter grip because I don't think they will be able to get really, I don't, I, ultimately I don't see this as being a successful operation. Um, but, but I suppose just to show the Taliban that they could move equipment around, but I don't, again, I don't think it will the Taliban were fighting foreign forces led by the United States and they're used to seeing that. Um, so the Tajik security forces and army moving into Gorno product, Sean probably doesn't impress them a huge amount. So, Bark, one of the major geographical oddities of Tajikistan is the fact that the, uh, the two sides of Tajikistan are pretty much connected by one highway. Uh, if the protesters manage to completely sever that highway and really dig in, do you think the central government has the ability to push through with confidence and uh, resecure that highway leading into Gorda Barakshan? Well, they already they already secured this 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 highway and. Uh... Uh, I suppose because they have all military hardware, they will be they they already moving the the convoys on this highway. Uh, but but again, this is the people of Pamir. These are you know uh, brave people. I, I I don't know how they're gonna stop them, but at least they they they're gonna do something to 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 stop it. I mean, nobody expected that people of Rushan will come and uh, block the military convoy just with sticks and stones. Uh, but again, that's happened, and I think that's kind of slowed them down because the the operation in Barhora was going to start two days ago, and I th- you know it's just unbelievable what people of Pamir are doing. They all they hold the whole this army for two two days, so and it's 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 we're going into the third day, so I think I mean anything can happen, but but again, it's just heavy military, you know, people, you know, armies and wall. I don't know how it's going to happen, but again, it's just. We just see what we see, but um, I'm sure it's not going to be easy for government. So, Bruce, how has the reaction been from the other Central Asian republics? Have we seen condemnation of, of the heavy crackdown or, uh, you know, are Tashkent and Bishkek still throwing their full support behind the, uh, behind the Ramon, Rahman administration? Well, as, as is usual, they keep keeping them quiet, fairly quiet about this. I mean, uh, you know, anytime there's any unrest or instability anywhere in Central Asia, the other governments don't want to report it because they don't want to let their pe- own people know that it's possible to, to for areas to be uh, restive and, and unstable. Uh, it might give them ideas. So I haven't seen a whole lot. You know, I, I did see, I mean, I saw one Kazakh website today that reprinted uh, the interior, Tajik Interior Ministry's statement, which was on Hobar. Um, so, so they got that, uh, you know, that up. And I know that, that, some Uzbek media has reported that there was unrest in that area, um, protests. But you know that that's about it. Just that there was some protests up there, and, and um, possibly it was a some small level conflict had occurred or something. But they didn't go into the background, obviously, of any of this. You know, you know how it all started um, and the repression that the people of that region have been under, and the, the uh, arrests and jailings of, of influential local figures, even some outside the country, and the what everyone expects is the arrest of other local leaders. That all that stuff didn't get it. So they, you know, there's something out there, but they're still, they're generally, they're quiet. And, uh, you know, at least in that case, of that one Tajik article or a Kazakh article, when they did, did put it out, it was, you know, it's absolutely verbatim the statement of Tajik's interior ministry about what would happen. So, Bark, this question comes from our audience as well. Do you think there's some political machinations happening in Dushanbe at the moment? This may be a, uh, a way for Rustam, Rahman's son, to be able to effectively, if this does go badly, take power and uh, try and form some sort of peacemaker between the, uh, the West and the East of the country? Um, no, I don't think that the, that the son of 
uh, Rahman has uh, that kind of uh, you know uh, authority. But but again, we don't know. Any peace peace effort might be welcome, but I I I I just don't see how it's gonna happen. And especially after what happened, you know, yesterday, seventeen people killed and two hundred people. There is that we just have to be realistic. There is no way nobody's gonna forget that. And people of Badakhshan, nobody, people inside, outside, it's just, it's not going to stop. Nobody's going to stop anymore. This is too much. Nobody, I don't think there's going to be any peace at this point. Bruce, how long do you think these protests are going to last? Well, you know, the sad thing about this is they usually have these intense periods of violence, um, you know, and then, and then everyone backs off because we've already seen that the, uh, a lot of a lot of Western countries, anyway, um, and uh, and other other international organizations are calling for you know some some stability, ceasefire, uh, everything. They, the Tajik government can't can't keep that up forever. You, remembering that one of their big cash cows is just kind of dried up, you know, since with Russia situation, remittances and uh, ability to send migrant laborers and stuff. So they're going to need a lot of these Western or Western countries and Western organizations to invest or donate to them in the future. And that might call off the dog, so to speak. Um, but in any case, you know, the pr uh, precedent would show that this will go on for a few more days. Um, and then they'll, they'll have to negotiate some way in, of, out of this so that they can stop the shooting and stop the violence and um, let things go as they have gone for the last 30 years again, you know, from building up to the next conflict. See, Nate, you're back with us now, if you can hear us. So how long do you think these protests are going to last and what do you think the, the final outcome here will be? I sure hope that it's not going to last for, for long. Um, um, again, I lack the expertise to, to, to really make a um, kind of a, uh, prediction on, on how long this might last, but I really hope it's not going to last for long. Um, in terms of the outcomes, um, um, there has to be a platform for a dialogue with the people uh, in Gbao. And this might be, um, you know, uh, optimistic thinking or the idealistic thing, but this is something what, uh, that we're going to be pushing for as Human Rights Watch, and we will be um, lobbying and advocating uh, for Tajikistan's international partners to also make sure that this is something that, um, you know, everybody is aware of that's happening in Tajikistan. Uh, and that's something that Tajikistan will have to respond to and will have to um, address these issues as opposed to just, you know, ignoring them and, and just killing people away. Bach, do you think that there's anything Dushanbe could offer the protesters to quell these riots, whether it be freeing prisoners or delaying sentences? You know, is there any way, anything that Rahman could pull out to effectively put an end to this without bullets? Well... Uh, I don't know anything that uh, he, could, he could have done everything in these 30 years. He didn't do anything. He's not going to do anything. He's just going to he's just going to continue killing. He's just going to continue suppressing. I don't think he can do or he has a desire to do this, to do any anything to de-escalate it. The only way to de-escalate him, to put him in his place. And people of P Pamirs and Gabao need to be empowered. And when I need say empowered, it has to be empowered by all means. If you want to have a little bit of democracy, if you need to have a little bit of, uh, like, even a hope of freedom in Central Asia, the Pamir needs to be supported. And it needs to be supported by all means. That's the only way to de-escalate Rahman. That's the only way to de-escalate all Central Asian di dictators. That's the only way. Bruce, do you think this is the first cracks in the rum on administration and we may see a change of government going forward or this is a small issue that uh, you know, they will be able to get uh, recontrol soon? You know, just because the region's cut off, uh, you know, from communications and, and you know, uh, as Senna said, um, people people in Dushan Bay know something's going on. They don't know what. And that's generally true, you know, up in Hojan and those places in the Northwest too. So I, I don't see how this could uh, really really harm Rahman's presidency. I don't see it as any kind of threat or something. It, it, you know, it'll certainly undermines further his image, which is not, which is pretty low anyway, internationally. Um, but, but this has happened before, you know, that's, that's the sad thing about this is it's a recurring problem. And, and every time I hear someone, even when this started, I would hear people say, you know, uh, you know, again, that the 
per, perennially, perennially, uh, perennially uh, restive area. They, you know, you see this every two or three years or something. It's unfortunate, but that's I think that's the attitude a lot of people have toward it. Is it'll die down. Some they'll come to some kind of some kind of truce, um, and we'll go back to where we were. You know, uh, 12, 18 months ago. Um, until the next next time the tensions build up again. But I don't think it'll hurt Rockland's presidency. That's the, you know, without a doubt. I don't, I don't see it. Uh, not this issue. And seeing that to close this out for today, what do you, how do you think this, uh, these protests will end? Do you think will further escalation is, is on the cards or that they will die out in a few days? Um, <laughs> uh, for the sake of people's lives, I would say it would be best, of course, for the protests to die out. But um, um, also just, you know, following the news and following the um, telegram channels and just, just sort of general chatter on this, on this, it, it, it looks like that the people might not be pacified so easily. So that this is a really difficult situation. Um, and yeah, my, my heart really just goes out to the people of Panera. Very much the same here. So thank you so much for everyone tuning in to this live Twitter space. Uh, if you didn't get your question answered, I'll try and answer them in the next couple of days. We'll have someone from Oxus answer that. Uh, big thanks to Bruce Panea, uh, Sinat, and Buck as well uh, for joining us on this Twitter space. It was a bit of a, a bit of a glitchy one today. I don't know what was going on with the Twitter app, but we got there in the end, and the wonders of live entertainment. Uh, we'll be back with another one of these in the next few weeks, uh, and we'll also be probably covering this story on uh, – the Oxus Society's podcast, Spotlight on Central Asia, where we cover the latest stories in Central Asia. But thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you very everyone. Much. Yep. I-